Okay. But, uh, as it turns out, various uh, communist leaders slash Russian presidents have allowed NATO to go get more friends. And NATO has gone from having 12 friends to having 30 friends. Uh, and, and so now Putin's really pissed that things have gotten this far. And now number 31, Ukraine, shares a border with Russia, whereas a number of NATO countries don't share a border with Russia. And, and so it's not an unprovoked war. Uh, and Putin has every reason to be concerned about Ukraine joining NATO and uh, the NATO weaponry being so close to the Russian border uh, and the U.S. suit that didn't want uh, Russian missiles 90 miles away in Cuba now wants to have uh, NATO weapons right up on Russia's border. Okay, and, and so... You know, uh, turnabout is fair play. Uh, and, and so, oh man, I had another thought and I, and I lost the thought. <laughs> um, um, I might think of it again. Uh, so let me see, let me go back to my notes. Um, well, so, saying things off the top of my head, you know, I've kind of gotten out of order. I have my notes in a certain order here. But let me let me pick up here and say this. That I can see Putin just needing to use a few nukes, maybe a couple nukes out of his 6,000 plus. You put, uh, firing a couple nukes into Finland, a couple of nukes into Sweden, uh, maybe four nukes into Ukraine. Uh, and, and of course, uh, because they're not NATO nations, uh, that wouldn't trigger Article 5. But I'm not sure if there's an article in there that, that says, hey, uh, if nukes are used within so many miles of, of NATO countries, then uh, we're going in. You know. But in, in any instance, he, he wouldn't have to fire an awful lot of nukes. And what I think would happen is we would d develop a nuclear mindset. Because people would be like, hey, look, uh, he, he went there. He went there, so we know he'll go there. And uh, so, and now that he's gone there, how, how much further will he go? Uh, will, will he lay waste to all of Europe? And the Putin administration, through various, uh, various members, has actually said that Russia can and will lay waste to all of Europe, okay, well, in a nuclear war, if they're provoked. Okay, and so I think Putin is serious. I think he's very serious, okay. And, and I think he's just giving ample warning before he finally goes all the way out and says, look, you know, we're all going to die today, you know. <laughs> and, and so... And we've put him in that position, you know, because it's like if he doesn't fight in Ukraine, if he hadn't invaded Ukraine, then there was a very strong possibility that we'd end up with NATO weaponry in Ukraine so that in the future, uh, be it 5, 10, 20 years in the future, uh, if Russia ever goes to war with a NATO nation, then uh, NATO already has weaponry so close to Russia that it'll be a decisive victory, okay? And NATO will be sure to win, okay? And so, if, if, he, if Putin had not gone to war, then he would have kicked the can down the road, and it might have been 10 or 20 years before a war broke out between Russia and NATO, and whoever is president at that time would be saying, well, what that damn Putin, he allowed NATO to set up shop in Ukraine, and now we're losing this war in uh, 2035. Okay, 
uh, and and so to keep from losing that war in 2035, Putin is making sure that that NATO doesn't set up in Ukraine. Okay, but because he did invade Ukraine, now he's dealing with sanctions. Okay, and I personally think that Putin chose the less dangerous path. I think it would have been more dangerous if in 2035 uh, NATO had weapons in Ukraine, a war broke out between Russia and NATO, and, and Russia got pummeled by more than 30 NATO countries. 33, and maybe Ukraine, Sweden, and Finland haven't been added. Okay, uh, and, and so, at any rate, uh, Putin chose the, the, the less harmful path, less harmful to Russia, you know, and he's probably already told all the Russians that, hey, look, you know, let's look ahead to 2035, you know, and if NATO is set up in Ukraine, and, and if my successor has an issue with NATO and goes to war with NATO, they'll be sure to lose because of the missiles that NATO has set up in Ukraine, okay? And so, he's probably gotten a lot of Russians to understand that, okay? Uh, but anyway, I know that's in my notes, but I wasn't at that point in my notes, and so let me go and see where I should pick up again. Uh, so, I said that already. Uh, so... A point that I might not have made yet is that by, by, uh, well, I guess I did make it in a way, but by Putin just firing a few nukes into these non-NATO countries, other countries will fear him, you know, and once he instills the fear of Putin into all of humanity, then, uh, then, uh, that, that'll go a long way to, to put it simply, um, and and so, and that will contribute to him be being the most powerful man in the world. As a matter of fact, I would argue that he even now is the most powerful man in the world simply because uh, his country has about forty percent of the world's nukes. Our country, he has just over forty percent. The U.S. has just under forty percent. Uh, but the U.S. has a very soft, sweet president, and so Putin actually has uh, the wherewithal to use those nukes. Uh, he, he, he's much more of a hard ass than, than Biden is, and so having so many nukes and having the willingness to use them uh, and being willing to just say, we're all going to die today, uh, that makes him the most powerful man in the world. It's been said that the most powerful man in the world is the one who has nothing left to lose. Well, I would say that equally powerful is the man who's willing to destroy it all. To, to be a homicidal, suicidal president who just takes everybody out, including himself. Okay, And, and so uh, and we know that it is possible to get people to that, to that place. Uh, to get soldiers to that place because there are uh, terrorist soldiers, if you will, uh, who go out and just drop bombs to themselves and they know they're going to die. But they're willing to die in order to kill. Okay, And, and so Putin may have already trained uh, some of his army so that they are both willing, so they're willing to die in order to kill. Okay, And, and so... That may be where we're at, you know, and uh, so we may be developing this nuclear mindset. You know, we're all going to die today. Uh, and, and so, let me see. I mentioned that already. Uh, I mentioned the Cuban Missile Crisis. Uh, I mentioned NATO bringing more friends to the table, or to the fight, rather. Uh... I mentioned uh, other USSR communist leaders and presidents failing to stop the expansion of NATO. Uh, okay, 
and I mentioned how Putin is, you know, damned if you do, damned if you don't, uh, and how that he chose the less risky path. Wow. So I got a whole lot of notes here that I, I wasn't actually reading at the moment, uh, but as I read them now, I see that I've already covered these things. Uh, oh, here's something I didn't cover. Uh, so, other, other uh, geopolitics, such as gas issues, uh, have exposed geopolitical failures since World War II like the failure to sever ties with autocracies. So, World War II ended in 1945. Uh, on September 2nd of this year, it'll be 77 years since the end of World War II. And uh, now, as, as we deal with Russia, the U.S. and various other nations are looking for other sources of petroleum uh, because Russia is such a big-time producer of petroleum and, and of liquid natural gas, LNG. And, and so, the world is highly dependent upon Russia for, for petroleum. Uh, now, I think they only uh, produce maybe 10% of the overall uh, petroleum in the world, but then there are regions of the world where where they get uh, 40% or more of their petroleum from Russia. So there are certain regions, countries, that are highly dependent upon Russia. Uh, because 10% is not a highly, it's not an, a very high percentage, but even though Russia may only produce 10% of the world's uh, petroleum, uh, they produce 40% or more of certain countries' petroleum. Uh, and so, anyway, um, there's that. But, in all these years, 77 years, we have not figured out how to uh, circumvent the autocracies uh, and, and to provide what the world needs without being dependent upon the autocracies. And so... Now that things are getting rough with Russia, uh, the U.S. has considered uh, loosening some of the sanctions it has on Iran. Uh, they've considered uh, doing business with Venezuela, even though Venezuela has a dictatorship. Okay, <laughs> and uh, that's not to speak of the fact that the Mexican president... Uh, did, didn't go to this uh, meeting of the Americas, whatever it's called, recently, like just last week. Uh, and it's because we, we didn't bring Cuba or Venezuela or some other country uh, in South America, Latin America, to the table. Okay, so the U.S. barred the uh, Latino autocracies and Mexico said, we're not coming either. You know, and and so, but there's that. But Biden has said himself, you know, that things are getting polarized to where it's democracies versus autocracies. He's already drawn the battle lines, okay? Democracies versus autocracies. And he said that months before the Mexican president said, okay, you're not going to, you're not going to bring the... Latino autocracy to the table. I'm not coming either. Okay, so this democracies versus autocracies thing, it, it's it's just it's growing. Yeah, and it's not going away. But but anyway, so there's that. And let me see. Uh, so now, almost eighty years after World War II, we're still dependent upon autocracies for some of our most basic needs, uh, namely energy, uh, because without energy, nothing moves, nothing happens. Okay, uh, but it doesn't end there, because Russia and China, two autocracies, do a lot for Africa, 
Uh, and in much the same way that uh, blacks are the poorest race in the U.S. percentage-wise, uh, not in terms of raw numbers, but, you know, in terms of raw numbers, there are more poor whites than there are poor blacks in the U.S., but as a percentage of the race, uh, blacks are poorer than whites in this country. Uh, and, and so, in much the same way that blacks are the poorest uh, race percentage-wise in the U.S., uh, blacks over in Africa, on the African continent, are dependent upon international assistance, uh, and they get a lot of it. Much of it comes from China, much of it comes from Russia. Uh, the U.S. also does some stuff in Africa. But anyway, um, that said, um, <laughs> well, as, as things worsen uh, with Russia, uh, as this war in Ukraine drags on and on, as the, as the international community tightens its uh, grip on Russia with uh, deepening sanctions, Russia is unable to focus on helping Africa. And so the war in Ukraine is causing Russia to uh, divert some of its attention, some of its resources to the war in Ukraine and to leave Africa abandoned. Uh, China is not yet in this war in Ukraine. Okay, now, they probably never will be. But in any instance, uh, China still has a free hand to do more in Africa. A and uh, China and Russia are becoming stronger allies. So that, that kind of goes to the whole... Uh, Strengthening, strengthening of the autocracies and the autocracies versus democracies issue. So there are so many different facets to this issue. Uh, Biden saying, you know, it's autocracies versus democracies. Uh, the Chinese and Russian autocracies buddying up even more. Both of those autocracies helping uh, Africa. The, the war in Ukraine diverting Russian uh, resources away from Africa so that Africans uh, are, are doing without whatever Russia was offering to Africa. Uh, we don't yet know if China is going to fill in uh, where Russia leaves off. Uh, we do know that it's not a competition, that China and Russia are not competing to see who can do more in Africa. We know that China and Russia are buddying up more as opposed to competing to see who can have greater influence in Africa. Uh, so that's not an issue. But but uh, anyway, we, we do see where the war in Ukraine and the tightening sanctions on Russia uh, are affecting the civilian life of Africa. A and so there may be many Africans who go without even though they're not part of the war in Ukraine. Uh, who, they go without food and other resources, and I think China's actually doing a lot of development in Russia, uh, and a lot of infrastructure development. Uh, and, and so, anyway, what a tangled web we weave, and I'm going to try to find my way back to where I was in my notes. Okay, so I covered that. Uh, covered the autocracies uniting. Uh... Russia, uh, Ukraine war is disrupting uh, food supplies. Uh, and it's actually been said, by the way, that the, the lack of food in places like Africa could lead to more conflicts in Africa. You know, in other places that, uh, where there are food shortages or where there will be food shortages, uh, as a result of the war in Ukraine, okay, and so you know, people when people can't get enough food, they they fight over crumbs, plain and simple. Um, so one war could spur other wars, um, and 
kind of leaves you to wonder if the geopolitical system might be on the verge of imploding. Uh, and of course that would usher in the New World Order. Uh, so it, things might get expedited. Uh, let me see what else I got here. So, I think that most world powers, most uh, presidents would give in to Russia rather than let Russia destroy uh, the entire world or a very large portion of the world. Uh, I think that if it became clear that that Putin was willing to just say, we're all going to die today, then, then uh, and if other presidents in other countries saw that he was 100% serious, that they wouldn't be so bold, they wouldn't be so brazen, I think that they would say, hey, look, you know, uh, we're going to have to de-escalate this thing however we can. We're going to have to give in to him, even though we don't want to give in to an autocrat, even though we don't want to give in to a violent man, even though we don't want to give in to someone who invaded another country. We're going to have to give in uh, in order to, say, to save the world, because if we don't give in, he's going to destroy the world, and then we're, we're not going to be here to give in. You know, uh, and, and so I think that Putin realizes that if he does the unhinged thing, then uh, whether he's pretending to be unhinged or he really is, if he does the unhinged thing, then then uh, others are going to soften up and and uh, give in to him. And then he's going to be recognized as the most powerful man in the world. Because I think he already is. But um, anyway. Let me see. I already covered that. Uh, homicidal, suicidal president willing to end all life. Uh, is the most powerful man in the world. Okay. Um, so. And let's bear in mind that it's the U.S. and other NATO allies which actually got Putin to that point. I mean, we, we put him in a position where he's damned if he does and damned if he doesn't. Uh, where if he didn't go to war, then we'd have NATO weaponry uh, right on his doorstep in a few years, and by him going to war, we're now sanctioning him, okay, and like I said earlier, Putin shows the less risky path, in my opinion, okay, now, let's bear this in mind, that Putin turned 70 in October of this year, October 7th, 2022, Putin turned 70 years old, okay, so, uh, He's in pretty decent health. He, he really is a, a bit of a health fanatic. Uh, and so, it's, he could see another 15, 20 years, you know. Um, but in, in any instance, you know, he, he's up there in age. Uh, and so, I don't know how many more years of work he has left in him. Uh, who, who knows? He, he, he might do another 10 years. We, we have... Uh, justices on the, on the Supreme Court that are uh, late 70s, early 80s. Uh, Stephen Breyer actually is like 84 and he's retiring. Act, and uh, well, Ruth Bader, Ginsburg, Ruth Bader Ginsburg was in her late 80s when she died and she was still on the Supreme Court right up to the time she died. Okay, uh, and so Putin could last into his 80s. Could remain president into his 80s. I don't know. But he knows that his day is coming. And I think it's not just a matter of his age. But but uh, as NATO gets so close and, and, and tries to move into a nation. Or talked about moving into a nation that shares a border with Russia. You know, it may not be so much that he's turning 70 this year. But he, but NATO is about to be to share a border with him, okay, and uh, a, a long border. I mean, because NATO already shares a short border with him. But anyway, uh, so this is his last best chance. Plus, he's seventy uh, in October of this year, you know, and and uh, so age and circumstance 
make nuclear war a wise choice for Putin. It's like, oh, hey, you know, he'll go out in a blaze of glory, you know. And so he wouldn't be the first to say that he wanted to go out in the blaze of glory. Uh, and so there's that. Uh, an interesting point here is that Kamala Harris could become POTUS uh, in late January, early February of 2023, uh, Biden could kick the bucket, uh, and if he, if he does kick the bucket any time after noon on January 20th of, uh, 2023, uh, then Kamala Harris can finish this term and still do two more full terms. As long as less than half of his term was left when he passed away, she could still do that term plus two more full terms. Uh, but anyway, um, if she does become president in 2023 or any time thereafter, then the U.S. will no longer be the most powerful country in the world. So she'll be the first female POTUS, but she will not be running the most powerful country in the world. Um, and my next point is that Putin will end up proving that that being the most aggressive and the most willing to kill everyone is power. Okay, and uh, that that kind of goes toward what I have to say about the new type of political power that is developing. I, I started out talking about the different uh, stages of human development from hunter-gatherer to... Uh, horticultural slash past 